Greetings, Mechie 102. This video is well specifically related to the non-uniform circular motion investigation, but what I'm about to show you could really apply to anything. I want to talk about a way that you could use built-in functions in the cells in Excel to do curve fits or to apply what Excel refers to as trend lines, what we've called in the past uh, linear regression analysis. So all those things are pretty similar. Um, what I've got here is I've taken some of the uh, representative data from the investigation, which if you recall is a rotational system where we are recording the counts as a function of time for this, this uh, system that has a constant applied torque, therefore a constant angular acceleration. Therefore, we expect a, a uh, parabolic or quadratic relationship between the counts, which represent angular position and time. And then I've also created a uh, scatter chart here of this angular position versus time. And again, the idea is, since it's a constant applied torque, it should be a parabolic or, or second order polynomial relationship to time. So what we've done thus far in order to, if we wanted to calculate the uh, representation, the mathematical representation of this trend, once it's, once it's graphed here, you could right click and say add trend line. And then when it pops up the information on the right, you could select polynomial, order two, and then I'm gonna say display equation on chart by checking the box. And there you have, let me actually increase the size of that so it's a little bit easier to see. There's our functional relationship of the trend that represents that. And if you wanted to, you could also show, uh, let's go back here to the, well, I gotta click on that to get the options. You could display the R squared value, which says it's one, so it's quite good. I'm gonna actually um, deselect that. Oh, well, I guess I can leave it on there. Um, but anyway, here's our quadratic fit or second order polynomial fit to the position versus time. And if you recall, it says here it's got y and x, but the x is time, y is angular position. Uh, we expect this uh, coefficient of what would be the t squared term to be uh, one half the angular acceleration. Now the negative sign I'm not concerned about just because of the orientation of things, it shows the angle decreasing. We'd be interested just in the absolute value of that. So two times the absolute value of that coefficient would be the angular acceleration. Now, in the particular investigation for this week, you'll note that there actually is quite a bit of data, quite a bit of different data sets. So you have to do this quite a few times. Every one of the data sets of counts versus time you wanna do this parabolic fit to. Um, it'd be nice if you could do this, say, with uh, formulas, and there is a way to do that. Um, and the ge generic one, the built-in one for Excel that does curve fitting or trend lines is the Linest function. So I'll say equals, I just selected the cell off to the side, L-I-N-E-S-T. And you can see here in the little pop-up help, it says it returns statistics that describe a linear trend matching known data points by fitting a straight line using the least squares method. That's a little bit deceptive. It does more than just a fit than just fit a straight line, although I think that's a not commonly known. Um, what it is really doing is a, a linear regression in general, which means you can actually do more than just straight lines if you know how to set this up. You can do any linear combination of, of uh, functional expressions, in this case to time, but generically to x. But let's just see how this works to begin with here in the, in the simplest sense. So I'll open the parentheses, you select the known y's, so those are the things that we're, we're fitting against the known x's. In this case, the, the y values are counts, so I'll select those. Then comma, the known x's. You could actually have multiple columns of x values, um, and it would fit against those for a multiple linear regression. In this case, I only have the one. And then there's some other options I'm not going to select right now. It turns out they're optional. So I'm just going to close the parentheses and hit enter. Interesting here, you'll note that it actually put now two numbers. I only had one cell selected. I only entered one formula, but it returned two, value, returned two values. Sort of makes sense if you think about this. If you were going to do a linear fit, a straight line fit to data, you would expect generally a slope and an intercept. And that's what it's doing. Now let's see if it makes sense here. So it won't match what I'm showing in the graph in the scatter chart because I have a, a polynomial there. Let me go back and select that. If I change it to linear, it's not what I want, but if I do that, now you can see hopefully that it does match up. Minus 7470 is the slope. Got a little bit more precision in the cells, minus 7469.96, so forth. So you can see actually that it does do that, it returns that. It doesn't really label anything. You have to know what these things mean. But the point is it returns the slope and then the intercept. 
Let's look at this a little bit more, actually. So I'll go back, and now, actually, I should also point out here, if you select just one of these cells, you might notice it kind of animates a box around the two of them. Uh, if you select both cells, actually, it still doesn't do it. This actually is what's referred to as an array formula in a sense. It's not, it's not a strictly an array formula like I'll eventually show you here, but they're tied together. So if you hit, for instance, if I select one of these two cells and I hit delete, it just kind of ignores that. If I type something else in there, like equals two, it does a weird thing. It puts the two in the cell that I had typed into, and it has this pound spill error, um, which is very strange looking. It still has the formula in there, but it's not working properly. But the point is I'm trying to make just that they are connected to each other. Let me come back and, and delete that. Let me do this one more time. Equals linest of the known y's. Come on, there we go, comma, known x's. It doesn't matter that I select from the bottom up here. All that matters is I've selected that column. Now, comma, and now you can see it gives you in the pop-up here some help. You're going to enter a true or false in this one if you choose to do so. If you don't, it defaults to true. If you put a false here, it says B, <coughs> excuse me, the intercept will be set equal to zero. That's not what I want to do here. But if I did, I could do that. If you enter a true, or by default, B is calculated normally. B meaning the MX plus B, the, the Y intercept. So let me put true here, which is already doing that, but I'll, I'll ex explicitly say that because what I really want to do, if I hit a comma to get to the last option here, the stats, it says return additional regression st uh, statistics. The, op the default is false, which means it won't return anything. So let me try type true in there and you'll see the difference. I'll close the parentheses. I'll hit enter again. And now it dumped a whole lot of information in here. The first two values that the, in the top row of this whole subset that it created um, are, as before, the slope and intercept. The rest of these values are all regression statistics. What do they mean? Well, if you go to your favorite browser, search for the Linest function in Excel, which I did, and I then went to the uh, Microsoft support.microsoft.com, which is one of my preferred places to get the information. You can read all about this. I'm going to scroll down a bit, and it gives you the what these terms and the statistics in, in those subcells represent. Somewhere in there is buried this R squared coefficient, which I want. That's the coefficient of determination. That's probably one you're used to. It popped up as one uh, when we did the built-in trend line on the, on the chart. There's also this SSRESID. It's the sum of the squares of the residuals. That's something that should seem familiar from um, a past uh, video that uh, we did that I did referring to doing using the solver to do linear regression. What's I think most helpful here, once you know what those terms represent, if you look at this illustration that's at the bottom, what it's going to do is the first row is going to contain all your fit parameters. In this particular case, they have quite a few because they were doing a multiple regression. Then there's some statistics about each of those parameters. The third row, first column, contains R squared. And the very bottom most on the right values is sum of the squares of the residuals. We don't really need to see that, but I'll point it out anyways because it's of interest. Really, it's the R squared value that's, that's kind of key here. Let's go back to the Excel sheet. So what it's saying is that the cell that I just selected, third row on the left, says the R squared value is 0.95466. That does corroborate what's shown on the chart. So all I'm trying to show you here is there, there's a built-in function that can do linear regressions. It saves you having to create the graph or the scatter chart to do it. It's not that that's a bad thing by any means. And in general, you should see what your data look like in order to know that you're doing a pro proper sort of analysis. But in the case of the investigation this week, you would have really probably over a dozen charts and it gets to be a little cumbersome. There, uh, there's some definite benefit to being able to do this with a functional relationship. So let me actually clear out. I'm gonna select the whole thing and delete those values. Let me go back to the trend line that's on the uh, the graph here, the scatter chart, make it back to a second order polynomial so we can make sure we can compare our results when we're done. Let me put a, uh, I'm going to put a, a, a white background to that so it, sh it shows up against the grid lines. That's just a reminder of that's what we're looking for. Okay, so the way this works, and I'll just kind of present this to you, you're still going to use the linest function. You are still going to select all your known y's as before, 
comma, all your known X's. Before you do anything else though, we're gonna put the caret, and now we're gonna put in curly brackets the set of powers that I wanna use for the X values. If you put a one, that means we're gonna fit with X to the first power, which we were already doing in the straight line fit, comma, two, if you put the two there, that means you're gonna to fit to X squared. Close the curly brackets here. I'm not gonna worry about the statistics and other stuff, so I'm just gonna actually close the parentheses. And let me point out before I hit anything here, um, you have to have both of these. You have to have the one and the two. If you just put two, it would fit to X squared, but not allow for a, an X term. And we want both. You can actually see from the, from the chart that there is a, a pretty significant number that the coefficient for X squared, there's a significant coefficient for X. There's a significant uh, constant term. And remember, I don't have to put anything to get the constant term. By default, it will always do that. So if I hit enter here, it returns three values as you might expect. And they go in the reverse order they were entered. So in other words, I entered the one comma two. So the first coefficient goes against x squared. And you can see that from the graph. The second coefficient goes against x. Again, it's verified. And the third coefficient, I didn't explicitly tell it to do that, but I, I, I didn't tell it not to. So it will always fit the constant there in that case. 30382, again, to a little bit more precision up here. And there you have it. So that actually will do the fit without the graph. I know the graph is here. I'm comparing against what's shown in the legend, so to speak, for the trend line. Uh, or the label for it, but it doesn't have to be there. I could actually delete that graph. Well, maybe I'll do that. It doesn't change anything in terms of my functions up here. So you could do this fit without seeing the graph, okay? I wanna leave it there for now, but in general, it doesn't have to be there. Uh, let me show you something too, just to, to, for completeness here. Notice that uh, if I wanted to turn on the statistics and so forth, I have to actually allow for it. Okay, I'll have to prove that, I guess. Let me go back here and redo this. Let me delete that. I'm gonna select just one cell and I'll type equals linest of the known Y's. Comma, the known X's. And again, caret, curly brackets, one comma two. If you do two comma one, just understand it's gonna flip the order of the coefficients, which is fine as long as you know that you've done that. If you forget, it's gonna screw up your results. Let me do true comma true, close parentheses, enter. And here again, it dumps the whole set in there. Here are my three coefficients. The third row, first column, again, is the R squared value, 0.999998, so very good, actually, and that's why it's rounded to one when you do the built-in trend line. These are NA over here on the, on the bottom right because that particular column, uh, since I'm not doing a multiple regression, there's nothing to fill in there. I don't think there would be in any event. Uh, if you're interested, there's a sum of the squares of the residuals. I don't really care in this particular case, but uh, if you had some interest and these other terms in here are also of statistical uh, significance you can you can figure out what they are if you're so inclined at this point i'll just say we've got if nothing else a pretty good indication of a good fit here i should also indicate again you do not have to show all of those results uh, and in general you probably won't want to do that as long as you can verify for a couple of these that you've that the, the parabolic is a good fit and it is for all of at least all the data sets that are in this uh, investigation on the non-uniform non circular motion um, it'll be, you'll be in good shape with that so let me undo this and just get back to where we were let me show you one other thing here um, i'm just going to have those all selected and I'm going to actually do two comma one just to show you. If you hit enter, it'll redo it. Now notice it's flipped the order. So now the 742 comes first, and then the 1565. Um, it's not that's not bad per se. It's just but you need to know that. Um, that just by default, what it does, whatever order you enter the powers in your formula, it shows them in the reverse order in the cells. And of course, it will always put the constant coefficient whatever it may be, if you ask for it, it will always put that at the end.
Okay, so I don't really generally want to do that. So what I could do here is I could actually set up here, what, remember what we're fitting is we're fitting something of the sort, in this case, of the counts uh, equals, and I'm just writing an equation. I could use the equation enter, but this is fairly simple. Uh, C1 x squared plus C2 x, whoops, plus C3, and these are subscripts, the one, and x squared is a superscript. So I'm just creating some labeling here. And then C3 also, C1, C2, C3 are just constants. And this is coefficient C1. That's a subscript, I'll hit enter. And Excel's pretty clever, if you select that, first label coef C1 and I drag that across, it'll know that to update those is the three different coefficients. So maybe I'll uh, center all these. I'll make this an emergent center and I'll put an underline. Um, and here maybe I'll put a, a, a thick bottom border. And so now I've got these three coefficients. Again, the first one goes to x squared, second one goes to x, and the last is just that constant value. So I've got a pretty unique, uh, or excuse me, a, a simplified way of kind of plugging in and doing this analysis here. So let me show you how this might uh, benefit you for the investigation this uh, week. Again, you could use this in general, but it's particularly useful for this week where you've got multiple data sets to do this for. On sheet two, I happen to have two data sets. They're also representative from this non-uniform circular motion investigation. The first set is the one I just showed you on sheet one. The second set is just happens to be another one. You can see I've recreated this kind of setup here and showing a, at least a numbering for the different trials. So what I can do here is I can use my linest function, the known y's, comma known x's, and then the caret, curly brackets, one comma two, close, enter. And then I wanna do the same thing for the second row with the next data set. Problem, unfortunately, is that you can't do any kind of copying and pasting here. Uh, you, you can't drag down the values, in other words. Uh, it doesn't work, and even if it did, the arrangement of how I just dragged this down doesn't match the arrangement of my data set. So it is still a little bit cumbersome in the sense that you have to actually manually type this in for these different trials. But nonetheless, it's easier than creating a bunch of graphs in any event. Even if I have to do this, type this in um, repeatedly, it's still easier. And of course, you could copy and paste a part of this, like the caret um, with the uh, curly brackets of the one comma two, you could copy that, let's say, and paste that in when you need to use it, okay? So again, I'll just show you here, uh, what I'm about to do sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, I'm gonna create a chart and show you that it does match up, but just again, to kind of prove that the process is working. So then if I add a trend line, again, it's polynomial, I put the inner, oh, sorry, not that, display the equation. And let me make that larger. You can see 2618.7 minus, that matches that. 341.1589902. So yes, it does match up correctly. I didn't have to create that graph. I just want to show you that it was working. I think at this point, as long as you keep entering it properly, you can reasonably assume that it's working correctly. And of course, once you have all your data done, all of it reduced, and you're doing your calculations to do the rest of your comparison of the physics of this problem, if you were to have some kind of a mistake in there, hopefully you'd see some weird results in, in your final answers, your final results, and you could come back and verify that these are correct. But this will give you a sort of a shortcut method of doing the multiple fits that you need to do for the parabolic relationships. You could even do it for the linear ones eventually that are gonna calculate your moments of inertia for this investigation. I would recommend actually doing those um, with the scatter charts because you're only gonna do one for each scenario, one for the no disc scenario, one for the aluminum, one for the steel disc. I think it's good in that particular case to see what those data, those, those data points look like. But that is the basic idea of using the Linest function in Excel. Thanks for watching.